Again, today we look at topic 2.6.1. Explain the concepts of limiting factors and carrying capacity in the context of population growth. 2.6.2. Describe and explain S and J population curves. And 2.6.3. Describe the role of density dependent and density independent factors and internal and external factors in the regulation of populations. Consider first a lab experiment involving none other than the classic lab mouse, Mus musculus albinus, and beginning with two mice under ideal conditions with no limiting factors such as food shortage or cold weather or predators or competition from other mice. Beginning with these two mice in mice utopia, if you like, it's not going to be very long before you have this. A litter of baby mice, typically with about 12 to 15 offspring. And even under ideal conditions, of food and temperature and freedom from predators with no limiting factors only about 50 percent of these baby mice are likely to survive so even under the so-called ideal conditions the mouse population is still limited by the fertility of the female mouse how many eggs it produces and how many of those eggs get fertilized and how many offspring it bears and also by how many of those offspring survive the critical first few days and then give themselves the chance of growing into an adult mouse in the wild it could be a lot less than 50 percent sometimes due to stresses from the outside it ends up being zero so with this formula of one mouse litter having six to seven offspring we can look at how the mouse population in the lab might grow under ideal conditions beginning at zero days with the two lab mice that we have in 30 days we would have about eight mice and after 60 days we would have another six or seven mice taking our population to 15. At the end of 90 days, our population would rise to about 22 mice. And at that point, the mice that were born on day 30, all of those female mice would be ready to produce young. So at day 120, we would have the critical event happening of a sudden jump in the population as a result of the fact that you're likely to have about five females producing litters of mice. And once that begins happening, then the population is ready to take off in its sudden increase or its exponential growth. We see that the slow initial phase happens when we begin from a small initial population. But once the number of reproductive females reach that critical number of five and it, it's only going to go up and then population is ready to shoot vertically up within a short space of time giving us the typical j-shaped curve characteristic of the exponential growth pattern this pattern however is only likely to continue if you have ideal lab conditions with no limiting factors in nature, such conditions often exist for bacteria and fungi. For larger creatures, it's less likely to happen. Let's consider the cane toad, for example. During the rainy season in South and Central America, cane toads spawn with great frequency and conditions are very close to ideal for the tadpoles to hatch and to quickly develop into young adult 
toads. With an extended rainy period, it's very possible that you could have some exponential growth in the toad population. But this growth is very quickly brought into check by limiting factors. Most likely in this case, it would be the limiting factor of the change in the climate as the rain stops and the rainy season turns into the dry season the environmental conditions no longer favor the j-shaped or exponential growth and several other factors apart from climate can come to affect an organism in a natural environment and thereby bring its population into check sometimes there is a sudden rise followed by a very rapid decline as a result of depleted resources or some other factor and this is referred to as the classic boom and bust Consider this question related to the fruit fly. So it is clear that populations can increase exponentially, but this exponential growth is likely to occur only in the absence of a range of limiting factors which usually do exist in natural populations. And here we can see the water flea, Daphnia, thriving in an environment that certainly is not ideal because the food source, the green water, which is really microscopic algae made up of uh, species like Chlorella and Senedesmus, these microscopic algae are not in unlimited supply from a few individuals, Daphnia's population gradually increased, eventually going into a short period of exponential growth, but this period of exponential growth was quickly checked by the limited resources, quickly gives way to a transitional phase, and eventually the population of Daphnia would be regulated and enter a steady state equilibrium as we discussed in section 2.1 and feedback mechanisms would occur to keep the population roughly at its carrying capacity which allows for some kind of steady state equilibrium between the algae population and the population of Daphnia and for more on this you should go back and have a look at lesson 2.1 So let's move to our blackboard now and get some important notes and a list of limiting factors we have here for us uh, include food, abiotic factors of which temperature is just one if we were dealing with a plant population like this one here then light would become another key abiotic factor the availability of water from the soil would be another important abiotic factor competition from members of the same species and from members of other species, inter- and intraspecific competition, predators, disease, natural events like hurricanes and earthquakes, fertility as we mentioned with the mouse, and the size of the area that's available for breeding, the, the habitat that's available for the breeding population. All of these limiting factors are sometimes divided into two categories and one is the density dependent and the other is the density independent and our picture right up here of the plant population is a good way for us to visualize this lots of these plants in here are in competition with other plants as the number of individuals per unit area increases the availability of food decreases competition 
increases. More predators may be attracted to the population. Disease would spread a lot more easily in large populations. But natural events like volcanoes, they would occur regardless of the size of the population and they would affect populations both big and small. Fertility sometimes in species like Daphnia gets affected by population stresses and the size of the breeding area that too is going to be related to the number of individuals that you have competing in a given habitat. So therefore most of the factors that affect populations are classified as density dependent. And let's not forget to include abiotic factor with density independent as well because things like temperature would affect both big and small populations. Again, density independent. Another way of classifying these factors is including some of them as internal factors. And as mentioned earlier, the fertility of the mouse is a key factor that we couldn't bring under control, even in the control the environment of, of the lab. And the size of the breeding area are classified as internal factors as opposed to external factors. So another way of classifying these limiting factors are things that are internal to the population and things that are external. The, s the fertility in particular is an excellent example of something that happens internally and in organisms like Daphnia complex changes in fertility happen as a result of stresses and limiting factors in the environment. Let's move now to your activity which is a simulation of population growth in duckweed. Here you see four individual duckweed plants and each little oval shaped structure represents one individual in the population. So beginning here we have four duckweed and our simulation runs for 24 days. Each two days we check in and we count the number of duckweed. Every two days we count the duckweed population. And we continue for 24 days. Note that by the 24th day we start observing some dead duckweed in our samples. With all of this data we can now create a graph of the population growth pattern here in Lemna, the duckweed. We can classify the shape of our curve and suggest some factors that can account for the shape of the curve and then classify these factors as density dependent, density independent, and then classify them as either internal or external. 